to the Chax Press sessions. These sessions are conversations among artists who may be poets or artists from other practices, speaking together in an improvisational mode, meaning beginning at one point and letting the conversation go where they will take it. Please enjoy. I'm Charles Alexander. I'll be both your host and one of the artists involved as poet in residence at Chax Press. Thank you. And the idea was to just really talk, and we could cover any number of issues, but it was certainly been hard in the last couple of weeks to ignore, and I wouldn't want to, the George Floyd issue, and to also see how we have, uh, in the last few months, uh, gone through kind of these major things that make me think we're in hell or something, whether that be uh, the current condition in terms of climate change and the pandemic and uh, what's been going on with police in America and what's been going on with our president in America. And I know, I think of all of you as, you know, poets who not necessarily tackle all these issues in your poetry, but you don't avoid them either. And you know, they're, they are, they are in your lives and they are registered there. Some of you, I think, and I'm thinking of you, Andrew, you know, pay more attention than I ever would to current journalism on these issues. Um, but some of you, you know, react in, in your own specific way. So I think I just want to ask, maybe I'll start from the, person farthest to my right on the screen as I'm looking at it, which is you, Julie, like, you know, what are you doing these days? And, and uh, how are, who are you, what are you talking about when you talk to poets? And what's going on in your work with regard to this moment? Uh, before I say anything, I'd like to draw attention to the sound of a can of beer opening. That was uh, Paul. <laughs> he just came in oh. um, <laughs> Hi, Paul. From, from work. And, um, but I was thinking today is the anniversary of um, the Dylan Roof murders right. of nine church attendants in um, Charleston. Yes. And I'd like to say their names, Clementa C. Pinckney, the church pastor and senator of the state of South Carolina, Cynthia Marie Graham Hurd, a Bible study member, manager of the public library, sister of a senator, Susie Jackson, the oldest victim, Ethel Lee Lance, who was 70, by the way, um, Susie Jackson was 87, the pain Middleton doctor, the, the pastor was also amazing credentials, 49, Twanza Sanders, 26, the youngest, Daniel Simmons, 74, Sharonda Singleton, 45, Myra Thompson, 59. So, and what am I doing? Um, uh, go from there anywhere you want to go. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm interested in that and historically, but I'm also interested in what we do with this as artists. Well, I'm trying to process that right now. I feel like I've been signaling um, and hollering my head off for a, a good while about the changes that this is a logical conclusion of from starting with the post 9-11 world and, and, and going back, the need for sanctuary, the need for people to take refuge in places and spaces where they can process this, whether it's a um, literary reading place or uh, an establishment like the one that I am sitting in. And this is where I put all my eggs in this basket. I took over land um, and now that COVID is here, I realized that just at the very moment that I was like, wow, I spent all this time fighting for this one inch of land with the hope of giving it back to a native community. Um, and then they started doing all this development, gentrification or um, 
stealing the land, more and more land. And, and without this space, I would be out of my mind because it's a space adjacent to the building. Like I looked at the Tree Museum of Art and all these museums, they had green space. So I said, the people can have green space. And, and it was a, a long, long battle. Really, I think the building tried to get that land in 1985. The building being an old Af an African-American co-op rooted in 1945. So I just, I kind of built on that legacy. Um, and to keep, I just have this feeling people will need safe places, uh, places where they can commune, but also just as significantly uh, for writers and poets, a place where they can go shut up, <laughs> shut up and shut in so they can have downtime and um, think, like almost like a, a, a monastery or a, uh, an ashram or the best word is a sanctuary. That's where you can hide from the law in a sense, or not hide, but be immune. You can't hide very easily and, and go deeper. So I'm still carrying on that work. If people need refuge, if people need housing, um, that's here. And there are libraries and instruments and all kinds of things that they can, and, and, and land to grow food. It's also a sanctuary for birds and wildlife. Uh, who are tearing up the service berries as we speak. So I'm I'm in my 60s, and I am also sitting blocks away from where the Glenville shootout happened, um, mm -hmm. which uh, in 1968, Tyrone might, as a Detroiter, be familiar with what that's like when your um, neighborhood catches fire. Um, so I'm, I'm just processing all that. I'm also thinking about words and language a lot. I was, my way of uh, trying to get insight into COVID intentions, uh, besides making sure COVID doesn't turn 20 in a, in a, in a year, <laughs> was to, I was thinking about how um, picking and playing with the letters. COVID reminded me of Covadis, and Covadis means where are you marching to? And so anyway. That's that's me right that's now. Yeah, that's beautiful. Would anybody uh, like to answer? Oh, Andrew. Well, I didn't know how you wanted to proceed, so I don't want to cut anybody else off. But uh, I guess, Julie, I kind of love the way that you lay out so uh, clearly. And at the same time, concisely, this uh, this journey, you know, in your life there in Cleveland with the garden and everything, but the way that you open that up by reminding us of the massacre committed by Roof, and though that from there we end up, as you said, uh, you know, in the effort you're making toward a place, a space of, of refuge and sanctuary where you can just do nothing if you want to and, and be quiet and, and maybe hopefully repair uh, one's own ability, you know, to process and comprehend things uh, as well as probably, you know, repair the emotional, psychological, and other trauma and traumas that you know, we individually experience, but then we also can't avoid not seeing so many others experience, experience in really horrendous manner, uh, you know, through all the video and news media, et cetera. Uh, it's interesting though, when you were talking about the uh, sanctuary as a place to you know, belong to and find refuge in, and you said something like, you know, and maybe just just be quiet. You know, it, it, it remind me of so many things, but one was not too long ago, I was in a conversation with our mutual friend, uh, Tom Donovan, and it wasn't the first time he had said this to me, and we were kind of talking, I guess, around somewhat similar things, and uh, he actually said, you know, maybe we should just stop writing. You know, maybe we should just stop writing poetry. Uh, and he didn't, I don't think he meant like forever, 
But I think he'd reached this point in his thinking about all this that he felt that this particular art, perhaps this is what he was thinking, um, at least for himself, can no longer answer to this moment that we find ourselves in, or at least it can't continue to answer and operate in the way that he felt he had been, you know, uh, practicing and participating in. But it rang for me also, it's just like, you know, we live in a world that is just constantly filled with and bombarded with product. And even though yep. it, as an artist, you don't want to think that what you're making is product. Uh, well, you know, all you have to do is look around and you can see uh, it's product and there's a lot of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so maybe, you know, just shutting up. I think that's what you said. Shut up. You know, maybe just shutting up for a little while so that one can cleanse one's thought and one's way of thinking and, and, and find equally, you know, valuable, if perhaps even more valuable avenues. Like, what, you know, it's kind of like how I think about what your, your experience with that building in Ohio, in that garden, you know, it's like, here is another avenue. And it can be just as social and encompassing and creative and wonderful and nurturing as any fucking poetry any of us have ever read in our lives. Maybe that's what Tom was wondering, you know, for himself, like where can he find his garden, you know? I don't know. Hmm. Just a thought, just a riff off what you were talking about a little bit. That's beautiful. Hmm. Well, to be honest, you know, sometimes we, we you you observe and, and, and hmm. interrogate media and it's overkill. And, hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's a cliche to say, how can we imagine peace if we can't reflect or find moments of peace within? And, and so I, I think for a lot of people who are older and, and also at risk, who can't take to the streets um, marching, some do, um, that they are beginning to like have breaks that they haven't had in their in in, in decades. Yeah. Um, to, to look at and also flashbacks and 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 to dig deep. And so anyway, I said enough, but I I, I dig what you said. And I and that so what um, Tom Donovan said did have something to do with my shut up and shut in project. At least enough to know that. Um, we need to make uh, room for other voices at the mic. Like even now with COVID, I watched the Facebook chatter and, and, and I, I could see people already constantly trying to turn it into profit or into something that's about them. And instead of like getting out of the way and say, who, what are the voices we have in her? Well, now those voices are rushing through. As long as they're not manipulated and we don't take the bait, that's the divide and conquer conquer rhythm um, that will make turn Trump into a, a sod, you know, gleefully murdering his own people. I mean, there were 700 um, in Ohio today. I don't know where this town was because Ohio hits the south at um, what Kentucky and West Virginia at the at bottom. Uh, Tyrone would know more than that. Um, 700 pro uh, arms. Um, um, people showed up in response to a mere 20 uh, people marching on in behalf of Black Lives Matter. And, and apparently some of the police stood by and, you know, watched, of course. Yeah. And that's said on my part. Well, your connection to Assad, I think, is spot on because that was exactly the thought comparison I made uh, whenever that was now, you know, a week ago when Trump did his walk out of the White House and the way the protesters were treated there 
and my sister who lives in DC and she said that fencing by the way was not just in front of the White House it was everywhere mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know just like yeah you know uh, it's not that far-fetched nope um, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation but I just want to say one further thing, Julie, because you referenced your sense of my um, attention to the media and stuff, right? And so, uh, you know, I think we've probably all heard this like too many times in the last three months. You know, there's this weird thing, this kind of weird uh, anonymity about American culture and this mundane message that all these talking heads constantly say, we're all in this together. <laughs> you know, how many times have I heard somebody say, we're all in this together? And I'm just going, fuck, what in the fuck are you talking about? You know, and it just, you know, it just makes me wonder like, well, you know, uh, where the country is then that, that separates us from ourselves if we're all in this together. You know what I mean? Is that right, right. It's just like, it's just some kind of fanciful, you know, conceptual bullshit, you know, that, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that makes me feel better. We're all in this together. I forgot that. Fuck you. You know? Sorry. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, I'm going to move on and, and ask uh, Giovanni, I know you're in one of the centers of this, you know, the Houston, the home of the George Floyd family, the, that memorial service was televised for you know the the world to see and do you have any response to what they've said so far or something uh, else to add i i wish that i did charles i've been holed up in my house because i'm in a high risk group um i don't have tv and am much more interested in in tuning into um i don't know a more expansive view of what's going on in terms of what's next, in terms of what's come before, mm -hmm. and building um, my sort of attention around that, you know, um, pacing myself. There's a lot of energy that's coming up, a lot of grief, you know. Um, and I, I guess for, for me, because I've, I've just had to pace myself that I really have not taken it all in at once. Um, what it does bring up, though, is, um, you know, the fact that I, I, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, you know, the former capital of the so that's, you know, that's on one side of me. Then I'm in the central time zone here with what's going on with the protests, the violence. Um, the school I attend is, is right um, around the corner from where he grew up. Um, so that, and then on, on the West Coast, which is where I've spent most of my life, there's, uh, you, know, you know, these really austere measures around, you know, stemming the tide of COVID. So it's like, where do you place your attention? You know, with all of these things going on, all of these, um, you know, sort of in one way or another, assault. You know, what do you do as a as a as a writer, as um, someone who feels a responsibility to looking at what's around? Them, you know, um, so I guess really I've just been connected also with my classmates who've been bringing me food, connecting to um, one sense of humanity and how one can contribute going forward as as a as a human being but also as as an african-american person you know, like what is next you know um almost like um the stress of stealing oneself you don't know what's going to come out of all of this or where it's going to land and so i take very seriously i guess what uh, julie's point of of taking refuge you know um and I'm finding that mostly in, you know, a lot of playlists um, and, and, uh, and soul train. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm not thinking of nostalgia. I'm thinking of, of, of things that 
you know, historically have been used in order to, to you know, wear down an uneven place, you know, to find um, yeah. different types of, of finding the energy to sustain um, one's, one's faith in, in humanity in the midst of, of so much um, discord, you know. Um, and particularly, you know, I've been watching um, and hearing from uh, things that are, go are going on in the place of birth and thinking about those statues, which, you know, are on a street in which, you know, um, on which the, um, the, the major, me you know, museum um, of the city and one of, uh, of the state is located, you know, so you have the art going on, you have the history going on. And you have people saying, you take down these statues, you do value my property and, uh, and you threaten my, his, my, my, you know, district as a historic landmark, you know, I'm really, you know, yeah. being really concerned about their property value. Um, um, yes. And so I think about that. And also one of my really good friends, because in a previous life, I was supposed to be a journalist. Um, really good friends is the managing editor of the, the black um, the black newspaper there which is uh, the free press and looking at all of that and, and they they highlight um, they have a column where they highlight achievements of um, people in the community and that that mainstay so you have that also it's not just you know the, the chaos the disruption the overthrow, but also the consistency of a reminder of achievement, of um, persistence and perseverance. You know, so those are some things that I think about. And in terms of building monumental words, I really have taken up over the last um, decade or so, I've been working with uh, John Cage's form of the Masastic, which I view as a kind of monument, but it's not static the way of actually having having an ongoing conversation with many of the subjects um, who are in there. So I guess that's, you know, that's my two cents, you know, just really um, a lot of practices that I feel will feed my soul um, so that I'm here for the, for the, the next steps, you know. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. That, Hello. That, before you go in there, uh, hello? Oh, sorry. But, uh, Giovanni, can you repeat what was this free paper? What's the name of it and where is it? Free Press. It's in Richmond? Yes, it's a free press. Oh, like Detroit Free Press? Yeah, there were a lot of free presses back established back in the day. That's interesting. So, you know, going in and, and being quiet is not an end to itself, it's within that, um, it, it has more to do with um, not being blocked in as the living, for the living in being the poetry community, but how the work disseminates out there into the street, into the world and realms like fungi, fungi and other soils and um, kind of creates mutualistic relationships that are underground and uh, probably, I, I don't remember the history of the, the that free press, but a lot of them, you know, um, came out to create as a result of the desire to create a, a different momentum and a different quote unquote, not so much product, but, um, um, you know, stream of information and access. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that we also mistake taking refuge as an action. You know, um, it's not mm -hmm. valid. And I mean, I think that there, there is enough space and enough people to go around to cover them all. You know? mm -hmm. and so different spaces. I mean, I, historically, that's been the case that people work on different fronts in, in, in different ways you know, from the sit-ins, from you know, the bus boycott and uh, mm -hmm. one way to contribute both singularly and communally, I think. Mm -hmm. I want to 
turn to Tyrone, who we haven't heard from yet. Yes, Tyrone. Hey, Julie. Hi, hey. Tyrone. Nice to hear hey, you. Julie. Boy, that was yeah. fun. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, tell Paul it's very impolite to open a can of beer <laughs> and, and not, not share it with the rest of us. <laughs> I just want to put that out. Here. Just tell oh, him I he said heard that. that. Yeah, good. Tell him I said that. Yeah. Do you hear him playing guitar? Yeah, yeah. I can hear him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's not a substitute. Playing? That's not a substitute for beer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tyrone, after you say something, you're welcome to take a one minute break and bring a beer back. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm just happy to, to, first of all, to see everyone here. It's great to see Andrew again and to hear Giovanni. My friend down there in Texas, AG. Hi, hi, Tyrone. <laughs> and Julie. Julie. Yes. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. I've been just like a lot of, like everyone else, trying to just make it from day to day uh, here. And um, not really, so just one step at a time. That's, I guess that's the, um, the mentality I'm in, I'm dealing with this, you know, with the, you know, Andrew and I have been talking about our respective faculty and the challenges they're facing in relationship to the, to, uh, to the administrations of, the, of our universities. But of course, this is happening, you know, across um, the, the country in terms of speaking of profits before people, the, the desire to recover money uh, and to lost revenue from the spring even if that means putting people, students, staff, and faculty at risk. So mm. that's, that's one of the things I've been dealing with literally on a day-by-day -day basis, as is, I know Andrew has too, in terms of his union. Um, and, you know, Tom, <laughs> that comment that Tom, I mean, first of all, that's very Tom, I should say. Yeah. That's, very, <laughs> that's very Tom, um, who has, Ever since I've known him, uh, and you probably, I know you've probably have, I know you have both um, Andrew and uh, Julie known him longer, but ever since I've known Tom, you know, he's been very, let's say, ambivalent about writing and particularly about poetry, but about writing in general and about even the work that he does as a, as a writer. Um, hmm. So it's not surprising that uh, he feels oh. this way about uh, this particular genre, because I think in his case, he's he's struggling with this whole question of genre uh, in relationship to activism, and you know he's come up with different solutions. You know he's been working on this long project called Left Melancholia, which I'm sure you know some of you know about. Um, so, and the other thing this reminds me of is that a long talk that Tom and I had. We both regret that we didn't tape it. But we drove out to Western New York for a, a poetry reading, speaking of poetry. And we had this wonderful talk along the way. Um, and it was actually better, as we both agreed, than the poetry reading <laughs> that followed. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, our attempts to recover it because it was spontaneous. Um, but it was all about these questions about, you know, the relationships, you know, which writers have been struggling with, you know, for millennia, right? The relationships between mm -hmm. art on the one hand and activism, you know, being in the polis on the other hand. And there's no there's no solution to that question, you know, because the moment you decide that uh, one of your identities is as a writer, you know, that automatically, automatically uh, marginalizes you in relationship to uh, a great deal of the of the public and, and society. And this is true not just in the United States, but you know, across the world. So there's that. So then you're going to be a writer, fine. But now you're going to be a poet on top of that. That's even more. <laughs> <laughs> it just drives you out even farther into the, into the hinderlands. Um, and so I think, I, and so I bring this up because I think because of that, uh, poets in particular, you know, we have this anxiety about what is our responsibility to the city that we've, you know, we have in some ways left behind, 
was our responsibility to the polis, to the people. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a good question, but as I said before, I don't think there's any one right answer to that, except that each person, you know, this is true for Jew, it's true for Giovanni, it's true for you, Andrew, for you, Charles. Every person has to decide, well, this is what I, first of all, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm good at. And so therefore, <clears throat> my contribution will be this. But not just that, you know, because I, I, you know, as you know, writing, no matter what kind of writing you do, is no substitute for political activism. Those are, it just can't be. That's it's a it's ridiculous to think it is. So what you do as a writer is one thing, but what you, you know, that's not the entire your entire identity. And so you have other responsibilities, personal, social, familiar, and you have to take care of those too. Um, so that's been that's been on my mind of of late. Um, can, can I ask you a question? Of course. Tyrone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so in the midst of those reflections, you said, you know, we've we've seen, you know, it's kind of like just historically, I guess, noted that often when an artist or a poet turns in a more um, overtly political direction within the work, it kind of seems to just push them further outside the uh, attention bubble, you know, of um, the poetry world, whatever that is, right, uh, per se. Have you ever been able to figure out like why? Like, what, what is it? What's the resistance or the consideration or? Well, the, the short answer. If you address, you know, like well, the kind of real time, real life issues that it's almost like you can be accused of, well, you're not really writing poetry anymore. Uh, well, yeah. What about Bar Baraka comes to mind, but go on. Exactly. Right. Well, that's, yeah. And, but, you know, Baraka is also you know, one of those figures that remains today controversial. And there's still debates, first of all, in tr to the extent that people pay attention to mm -hmm. Baraka, by which I mean people within the poetry world or within academia pay attention to him. There is still the debate about, you know, what's his good poetry? You know, where is he really good at? And then what's his, just his, um, um, what's the term? I, I guess you might say propaganda, though that's not the term that's often that's polemical. Often used. polemical. Yeah, his polemical, yeah, his polemical works. Um, agiprop, that's the word I'm looking for. Wow. It's, it's agiprop. Um, and um, but you know that question, the moment you ask that question, you you you're immediately invoking this tradition, uh, this Western tradition of poetry as. Um, and and not just not going back to Plato, but really starting in the 19th century, or I should say the 18th century, this notion that poetry should not be didactic. Mm -hmm. That because when I was growing up, the first thing, one of the first things my teachers, not growing up, but in college, I guess I was still growing up there, but that's a whole nother <laughs> question. Um, my <laughs> teachers, <laughs> no comment still from the. Growing up. No, no comments so from the peanut. Out. No comment from the peanut gallery. <laughs> yeah, this is the almond gallery. Almond. This oh. is the only gallery. Okay. <laughs> um, I was told explicitly by my teachers, you know, and I read, you know, I read the new critics about this. Right, didactic poetry is like the bottom of, the, you know, in terms of the hierarchy of different types of poetry that you can write, mm -hmm. and that that idea came from the, like I said, the eighteenth, early eighteenth century. It was not that way prior to that, you know, if you read, because I, I teach 16th and 15th century poet, and they, those guys are all like, you know, railing against the king and the queens and, you know, explicitly mm -hmm. political. So yeah. it's only since the, you know, in the last two or three centuries that this, we inherited this notion that poetry should not be political. Um, and since most of, most of our teachers in poetry, even today, still are under the influence of the new critics and so forth, that's why you still have these debates. Right. So a romantic, a romantic notion of, 
of poetry and the arts is separate from life and it's uh right because of the whole industrialism you know issue in the in, the, in the yeah. england and, and the, um, scotland and so forth as a poetry is a kind of retreat from the from the messiness of industrial life well, uh, i understand mm -hmm. that but i think we've we've made it that in in a way that you look at some of the romantic poets at least and shelley is political absolutely you know but and, people, and always was yeah right right but people don't, you know, people, a lot of writers, uh, sorry, teachers, academics don't regard, first of all, if they, when they rank the, the big six of the romantic poets, right. the top is worse, worse, right? He's yeah. at the top, followed by you sometimes Keats, and then maybe Shelley. So, and partly it's because, as you said, Charles, that Shell, because of his, you know, as explicit politics that's all over his poetry, uh, and so a lot of people don't know what to do with that. You could say uh, the same of Blake, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, say yeah, Blake. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this goes, this goes to the playlist, you know, that Giovanni was talking about. Um, you know, you brought up Baraka. And my playlist includes, you, you know, the, the music, the literature, the movies, everything. And the books that have been flying off my shelf at me lately have been Baraka and Baldwin and Gwendolyn Brooks and, and a few others. Uh, I notice whenever I turn the TV on now onto some streaming service, and this wasn't obvious several weeks ago, but now, you know, there's all the stuff having to do with Black Lives Matter. So, you know, yesterday I, I watched a documentary on August Wilson. I've seen two Spike Lee films in the last week. Um, you know, and then I've been listening to, you know, Parliament, Funkadelic, and Sun Ra, and uh, um, uh, Eric Dolphy, and, and so, and, and I think it's not just because I like that, but it's actually a little more obvious in the culture right now because of what's been going on, and I hope people are changing their playlists, and that's getting in their heads a little bit. I don't know if that's happening everywhere or not. Well, let me, because I was thinking about this beforehand. Um, so the number one book in the months after 9-11 on the Times bestseller was the Koran. Yeah. So I just put that out there because, and I can't remember who said this, but uh, what we have now, the phenomenon you're talking about, and I know this is just you know, old cynical me saying this, so take it for the, for the grant, you know, Great, great assault. But to me, this is just a kind of you know cultural looting that's going on right now, uh, yes. because everyone knows that you can. There's money to be made at this moment. Uh, you've got a if you've got a a black book, and you're a black author, and this is not to disparage you know the books that people are reading and so forth. Mm -hmm. But you know a lot of those books are being bought. But as I said to someone online, that doesn't necessarily mean they're being read, much less even being understood. Yes, I I would agree with you, Tyrone. And I so many top. Uh oh, here comes the peanut gallery. <laughs> the almonds. Almonds. Almond. Okay. Okay. Sorry. You need to update, update your lingo here. Come on. Um, the okay. almond. He <laughs> submits that there are um, a lot of you know top ten lists of what what you should be reading and watching. Mm -hmm. They're circulating, and I'm thinking, well, I've got those all covered, so then what? You know, right? <laughs> like, right. You know, what, what does that mean for me? I've been reading this stuff all along. All your life. Hey, okay. did you see the? Did it, you see you the know, letter? Means, Sorry, Tyrone. It means. No, um, I would just say, did you see the letter that I reposted from uh, from um, Douglas Kearney? Mm. Um, I, 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 I spot read, read it. it, but I did not read it because I've been in a lot of those anthologies with him. So I just thought by him not, <laughs> by him saying that he's not going to respond, that he already right. wrote, that, he already wrote the submission right there. With the <laughs> <laughs> just go ahead and put it in there. So like you give, you've done what you said you weren't going to do. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? yeah then no get to the issue. Right? This is the case of action speaks louder than words sometimes by just, you know, <laughs> politely declining and moving on. 
the ministry right. to in there and say, okay, these are all the reasons why I'm not going to do it. Meanwhile, I am doing it in the form of this letter. But yes, thank you. It's, and it's true. It's true. He did say it was okay to repost it. So clearly he wanted it to be <laughs> spread. There's no question about that. It'll wind up in an anthology somewhere. <laughs> well, you know, and there's the, in, in, you know, increasing the fan base, you know, and how right. is that any different than the, you know, the rally that's, the, the rallies that are going if, on. If you order now, you can also get. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie, Julie and I want are, are working on some T-shirts and some bumper stickers and wow. some other. Well, I've not been, some, Yeah, I've been suggesting that to Giovanni because she polls. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't mean to out you, but she's oh not rich. <laughs> you know, I mean, she's not rich, but she's in graduate school. And I'm looking oh. at some of her work and, you know, the one with the map of America with the guns pointing to each oh, other. Yeah. It, yep. and, 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 and this stuff is uh, amazing. And I'm like, I, I, in fact, uh, Charles, I almost called you uh, to get the name of the guy you said was in Detroit that a friend of yours. Amos Paul Kennedy Jr. Okay, because I thought that's close by. I used to do limited edition silkscreen printing mm -hmm. um, as for gigs way, way back in the day, and it's too toxic for me. And it's also a different method, uh, method since it's digital. But all this goes back to uh, representation is the you know is the basic form that the will to power takes. So. Immediately, I thought of the uh, the reaction in the media and everybody like uh, acting like it's it's February uh, every day, all day, every second. Is the corp the corporate world said, "Yo, you know, we can't we can't survive without the black uh, uh, without black culture, either selling it, pimping it." or as consumers or as players, whether it's in ball players or, or whatnot. And, you know, so there's a, a lot of, um, and also just, you know, controlling the narrative and, and, and never stepping back. It's, it's you know, um, so I, I'm, I'm just kind of watching it. I don't believe everything I see or hear. And um, I'm actually kind of um, uh, slightly nervous uh in terms of about infiltration and what strings are pulled and anybody who's our well within our age who can remember um how that pepsi commercial just you know the counterculture movement just became the pepsi generation and how things because they have the money the advertisement the you know and just to circulate and and then co-opt and um as a strategy, uh, not that they can really, I, I don't know, it's complex right now. It's real complicated, but it always is. Yeah. Controlling the narrative. I mean, that's, I mean, that reminds me of Andrew's comments earlier about um, we're all in this together. Because of course, you know, when I turn, if I'm watching the news, or any, you know, I, I get that message, even to commercials, right? That has oh, become yeah. the, the, from the commercials too, we're all in this together. And so it's it's all about controlling the narrative and smoothing over the rough edges and the explicit divisions, um, you know, that have erupted over the last three three months. So um, coming yeah, in with that leaf blower. <laughs> the what? <laughs> coming in with that leaf blower and lawnmower the blower. and paint the, <laughs> paint the forest. Julie Patton, why did you have to go <laughs> at? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a, I'm like suffering from the from the noise of the mowers and leaf blower and construction, Giovanni, you too? Oh. Yeah, I definitely am. And, and I feel like, you know, people are trying to keep themselves busy and trying to, to contain and control the landscape. And so landscape yeah. are deemed as essential here. And it's been mm -hmm. it's not stop every single day. And I mean, they come with like their pickup trucks. They come in gangs. And they, they have these pickup trucks with these trailers filled with all of this equipment. And they're mostly, you know, brown and black people who are doing this. You know, people who were initially charged with, you know, stewards of the earth. Who are now, like, in 
like taming it and, and beating it into submission. And so, you know, you always have that going on in the background. Like, whoa, what is really going on? The bees are leaving. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's like instead of us living within the forest, we have to tear it down and tame it and, you know, the, and that's what makes me think that that the word like blackness is not just this term, it's part of a, a, a larger ecology. And also the sense that, you know, when we were young, uh, um, black culture was being urbanized more and more. I mean, that process had, process had begun with industrialization and da, 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 da. But um, I think for many people, that's uh, this field of concrete and, and, and is, is what, define has uh, came to define blackness and and black culture and and so you know hindsight and looking back i often speak of when this word took root uh like it just landed in the field and then it became invasive but um you know so there's uh this thing to make a sign even more concrete and to stick to it and all this uh, policing isn't just policing of identity uh, along these lines and I'm, I'm the divide and conquer and the cuts and the slice and the mowing and the lead blowing and ay, 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 ay. you know so we're like politically in realms of succession but each with each layer of succession it gets less and less um, um, the actual in actuality unless you're the ecology is more homogenized. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I'm witnessing, and I could be wrong, a kind of homogenizing of culture um, as these, as representation is participated in and is co-opted in and gets co-opted by and what for, what not. Well, I just want to jump in on that because complementing that and also what everybody said and Tyrone you were talking about this idea of controlling the narrative and Julie you nailed it several minutes ago when you used the word in response to uh, what Tyrone had said there by using the word pimping right so we have you know this certain narrative being pimped it doesn't matter if it's MSNBC Fox CNN uh, sometimes PBS or, or wherever it's coming from, and as Tyrone, as you mentioned, <laughs> even in the advertisements, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, but at the same time, I also sense something maybe different happening, something shifting. So what you just described, Julie, I think is, is right on. It is kind of nails, you know, the, the crisis of this moment. Mm -hmm. But it's almost, I'm starting to feel like I'm seeing that, that whatever we want to call it, the pimping or the, the pushing of, of a certain kind of narrative control of the dialogue so visibly, so blatantly, it's becoming so transparent that whenever I tune into this stuff, I feel like I'm getting another lesson in you know, how to decode this stuff. And it's becoming more and more apparent you know, the, the line and the, the manufactured, you know, old concept, the manufacture of consent. It's just like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, right. That's how you do it. Oh, look, there's another great. <laughs> oh, God, it's so apparent. How could this fool anybody? You know, I, I, I kind of get caught in the middle sometimes. I'm going, everybody sees this, right? Doesn't everybody see that? And, and then, of course, in the next few moments, they interview somebody else, and then I realize, no, they don't, you know, but, but you know what I mean? It's almost like it's, things are up against it so tight now, so hard, that it, it's like, yeah, that effort is there. They're, they're trying to regain control of the, of the language, of the discourse, and whatever direction this can, energy can be channeled in, but the methods that are being used to do that are so well known now and they're so obvious, right? I mean, you... that, that attempt to control the narrative to me is so obvious when you turn to the COVID-19 and the, the whole, you know, governors, you know, want their states to get back to work and get back to normal. 
and and it and it's so not working because people are still dying. I mean, more are dying here than were a couple of months ago. Maybe you know, it might yeah. not be the same in New York. Uh, more are getting sick, um, and and also that whole narrative leaves out all kinds of people's experience. I mean, we hear here, and I don't know if it's heard all over. You know, like what high percentage of the of the Navajo Nation suffers from this disease? You know, it's it's just um, Paul just said that's the highest death rate in the U.S. right now. The yeah. Navajo, yeah. yeah. You know, and you probably you know know some of the people from there. I mean, um, Orlando White. Uh, I think Sherwin Basui has had a lot of time up there. Uh, oh. Lely Long Soldier, you know, a bunch of people that in the poetry community have real connections there. Well, that makes me go flashback, and I'm always trying to figure out, because I was young, you know, um, younger than I am now. Um, <laughs> I, I seem to remember a, a moment in the movement of movements, and that's the other thing when I'm thinking, and Tyrone, you might remember this, like, you, okay, you have Black Lives Matter, right? But I read that in Cleveland alone, um, in 68, there were no less than 50 different civil rights groups. And so that's mm -hmm. what I was, I'm, you know, trying to think. It's, it's not maybe with Black Lives Matter specifically that it's, yeah. it's reflecting homogeneity, but a, a specific discourse and platform and, and, and focus, which has been amazing. Keep people as I glued on that prize of this is the issue, incarceration, police, and this goes back to slavery. So, you know, that's great, but I do wonder, um, I mean, I know that there are other things around, but I just remember how ragged, <laughs> in a way, the 60s were ragged with all these different polemics and people coming at this and that, and then someone posted a whole uh, piece about um, the, when the Panthers were in Algeria, and then Timothy Leary comes and shows up, and then the, S the Weathermen and the SDS. And what I'm remembering from back in the day, and it's not so much uh, uh, um, because it's like the global um, culture, and people think this is globalism is new, but I remember not ever not feeling linked to the international world to the point where young kids knew who um, the world leaders were and, and, and what they were up to without having, um, be, because journalism was different. Every town was like, at least it seems like a two newspaper town. And it was before, what are they, they was it the freedom of, um, what's the thing that Nixon pulled, um, Reagan pulled, the fairness doctrine. Everybody needs to go back to the fairness that doctrine and, and, and the before and the after. But uh, what I was about to say when you mentioned Lele, Lele Long Soldier and, and, and Sherwin and all these individuals dealing with this COVID struggle potentially in their families is that I remember, and it could have just been one conversation in the communities that my, the elders around me were attached to. And then also maybe because Russell Means um, was had come to Cleveland and and um, uh, be, to uh, be in solidarity with these organizations because King decided that his next move was to deal with quote unquote the Jim Crow North and that Cleveland was the the going to be the place where they parked that that flag because of its relationship to. Um, at that time, Cleveland was called the best location in the nation because of the way planes could get in and out because oh. you're by Chicago, Detroit, and then the gateway to the south. And so, and also because of the amount of, um, his wife had a relationship being in Alabama and this is North Alabama. But I remember very explicitly people saying, all right, we're not going to go with that other idea of social and economic lift, uh, uplift because it will, you know, get us in, in, in trouble with uh, kind of the political ecology and, and, and um, a moral e uh, economy that is suspect. So we want to identify more and be in conversation with the struggle of indigenous peoples around the world 
whether they were Palestinian or Native American, and 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 that conversation disappeared, as did the kind of uh, um, the the communication with Africa and between Africa and um, African Americans and the and the continent and those liberation struggles. That so it was it was a time of great fomentation in the Caribbean and uh, Europe and and the Middle East and you know. And so the, the, I guess what it is, the whole planet has been homogenized so that what's at the roof, speaking of Dylan roof, <laughs> what's at the top of the cha- the food chain uh, are just these kind of iconic um, signature um, m- memes or whatever one might call them and organizations. And is, is that the tendency to brand things like the media and everything jumping on stuff and branding it overnight? Well, that's ancient, right? But maybe it just is li- a little less breathing space. Um, and, and it's just all compression. And more, maybe more control over and shutting out what would be an otherness to that narrative. Well, it's like the science of coercion, right? I mean, like post-World War II, you know, you have all the intelligence agencies and, you know, all the recruitment out of Nazi Germany and stuff and sociologists, you know, and academics participating in this, right? So there's a whole body of literature about this that's very explicit, you know, politically about its social purpose, right? It's about social engineering and and passive, mm-hmm. you know, the public, you know, uh, composed of many other smaller publics, right? So it's the science of coercion. And so acknowledging that, Julie, which is what I hear is the big kind of envelope in, in what you were just, you know, uh, reflecting on, um, at least in part, uh, it kind of brings me back uh, again to earlier in our conversation. So if we're, if we're writing poems, to what extent through that work of, of writing poems and publishing poems, et cetera, can we um, not just contest like polemically or rhetorically, but actually somehow almost functionally push back on those very powerful traditions and institutions of, of um, you know, domesticating people's thoughts, you know, of, of coercing people even without their awareness in many instances, right? I mean, it's, it's woven in. It's like, again, that, you know, we're all in this together. Huh? It's like this, you know, simple little language formula, and it's like meant to like set off a bell. Oh, yeah, right. Um, so it becomes unconscious, right? Which is, of course, what the science of coercion is about. They, you know, it doesn't work if you're completely aware of it, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's what I meant earlier. It's like I feel like we're in this weird moment where it's, there's a, maybe a possibility that more people can go, oh, wait, I didn't notice that frame before. You know, like, oh, that's the shit that's going on, you know. And so I don't know what there is specifically that one can do in the space of lines or poems or visual images to contest that work of coercion, which is a form of violence, of course, right? I mean, it's manifests itself in, in many ways. I mean, Tyrone, you and I have been talking about that just through our work as educators, you know, through the struggle of our unions against administrations and, you know, state governors and stuff who not only are neoliberals who want to defund any kind of public, you know, or other education anyway, but they have no particular regard for even contractual obligations that they've signed their signatures to. You know, I mean, it's... (laughs) You know, it just, that's violence, right? Because that's, that's just blind, that's just blatant. I'm going to make you do something. I'm going to coerce you. I'm going to 
create the conditions that will force you, you know, to throw your hands up and give up and get in line, you know, because if you don't, I'm going to threaten your livelihood. Right. And lots of colleagues right now who have lost their job in the last two weeks. And then come September, they are not going to have a job. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh oh, watch yeah, out a bunch of angry poets. <laughs> what? Well, you know, the you know, doing the work, attention to language, complicating the language, and um, you know, maybe I'm not saying that's a good thing, but um it will um make uh, uh, people uh, move into other watering holes. And of course, there's the poetry of the streets and, and music and all of that stuff that's out there. And I was when I was talking to Giovanni earlier, when I had to coerce her and use other methods of violence to agree to uh, participate in this conversation. Um, <laughs> Giovanni, you were talking about these words that you can't stand, these uh, um, oh, common yeah. sense. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about that because, you know, <clears throat> as poets, you know, one of the things that we um, must be attuned to, we use our ears. And so when I hear things that are being promoted, like up level, next level, you got this. I mean, they don't, they don't, they, they fall flat, you know, and I don't. So I, I've been listening to the language of what's going on and how you can, um, actually feel inspired or interested in the least and why throw why do we have to throw out the past you know are those slogans <laughs> no they're, they're they're parts of conversation um you know they're easy way out easy easy ways to communicate i guess maybe it's the um sort of language of marketing of capitalism of um of um you know, tweets and stuff. I'm not on any of that, so I don't know, but I, I hear it and it's like, oh, let's take a deeper dive. And maybe it's more of a California thing too. And, you know, the, the um, people who are offering, you know, services, self-help <laughs> services, self-improvement, um, they, they really want you to, to take their master class. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> these these yeah. trouble these troubled times. There's so many masters out there. It's, a, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. one, of, one of the things poets can do and, and have done is to take some of that language out of its context and just show how ridiculous it is. <laughs> well, yeah. well yeah. Yeah. But then you got to get somebody to read it. I have to consider whether or not that's a good look. <laughs> well, I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking particularly of a. I'm thinking particularly. I, good look, Charles. <laughs> I know, I know. I have a, a friend who was a young poet here. She's in California now. Her name is Heather Nagami, and she. Oh yeah, used to, I know Heather. Used to, uh, you know, pay attention to the late night broadcasts of city council meetings and just write it down as it stood and publish that as a work in a in a in a book that that I published called Hostile. And uh, it's kind of brilliant, but I understand it doesn't sound like a good look. <laughs> but it reminds, me of, it reminds me, of, uh, Charles, of Hannah Wiener's book, where she yeah. just looked at the television and just wrote down all the television and filled a whole book. Yes, which yeah, gave us and it was Kevin Ghostman. I have to say, you know, it was like it's kind of like pre, pre, pre conceptual conceptual right. poetry, right? right. Right. Yeah. So Witness to doing that, and it was like it was really eye-opening, right? Because you you would have those moments of recognition, and go, oh yeah, right, yeah, God, you know. Well, and I've been crediting I've been crediting a lot of my uh, you know my critique of institutions and their money holes and all this stuff is one thing, but I I do see uh, or I have a sense that um, a lot of educators. Um, the friends of ours, people that we know, you yourselves included, have, uh, you know, have played a role in, in um, complicating some of this and have bent some rods and that there's no way to know that. But I, I sense that the way poetry, the, the poetry in the schools movement, the, mm -hmm. not the way art is co-opted again by museums and turned into cliches and 
ident you know very and and co-opting identity uh to for profit um uh, but I, I do think the last 40 years, whether it was the Victor Hernandez Cruz and, the, and, and, and David Henderson and people who taught in the storefront movement and June Jordan, who I first met at Teachers and Writers, I'm often not deemed black enough. So when it comes to <laughs> situations where people are honoring or, or reviving these names, I, I don't usually get associated with um black uh individuals of greatness and i uh, have to come bringing up the rear that's not a complaint it's just like again perception you know be, for people who are who um maybe straddle different categories because i'm part squirrel and i have webbed feet and fish lips um so they don't know what to do all the time where where to place me but um and i don't mean people who speak and and feel like it's their job to um convert um you know their enemies but just i i do feel how many of you think that people have played a role because there have been thousands of, of poets and musicians and people um flooding all kinds of spaces i don't I, anyway i mean i do think they have played a role i think poets are creating you know a kind of what Foucault might call a counterconduct, which is getting beyond both the 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 narrative of oppression and a, a predictable narrative of resistance to that, to do some othering, some some querying the language, some true counterconduct. I I think, of course, the difficult part is who's listening, who's reading, and and is it impacting. Or will it someday impact? I mean, none of us are also writing just for today. I mean, I think we we hope these things are are read for a while. Mm -hmm. In addition to what's happening, you bring up an important point: querying the language. And yes, I mean, one of the things that gives me great happiness is just looking at how many colors are in the rainbow flag and you know we got a lot of it this week because of the supreme court decision and yeah. and 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 that's a real um you know a two-way well multiple dimensions and and in terms of bridge building um and um complicating the narrative right there space and um and right. so maybe how would that change and affect people's writings if they are sitting down and writing at night and they do hear a gunshot, at least they know what's going on in America instead of well, just Julie, this, the, co the it's coverlet. Do you think it's possible for these kind of local constellations like you know what you're involved in, what you're describing to, to replicate in, in greater numbers? Because you know, no, I, I've, because heard, I, I've heard this is like a kind of a, a debate within certain you know, cultural thinkers or something about, is it possible to, you know, kind of rejuvenate our, our democracy so that, you know, it's, it's more just, et cetera, by having more and replicating more of these kind of really important creative Local. Well, I think that they're uh, out there. It's, or is it it's or, just, or getting buried beneath the monolith of the, the, the corporate kind of message? Yeah, and I think that they should stay buried in order to <laughs> be real and keep on keeping on, like the underground, you know, cultures. I think it's a matter of connecting the dots. Like I was talking with Leanne, she has her project. There uh, are all kinds of watering holes. What, what Tom Donovan has done, what you do, you know, all of them. And maybe we need to, um, um, you know, just make a map, you know, and, yeah. and where people can find each other if the state comes down hard and, you know, returning to letter writing and prayer and chants and mantras. And, you know, it, it's already there. As you know, um, there's uh, the, just like the medic movement. And I remember an Occupy and all kinds, it's all there. It's just drowned out by all the branding and all the capitalism, but right. maybe that's good. Maybe that keeps that stuff 
on a um, um, struggling on a level that keeps it in touch with uh, the issues in a dynamic way. So it's to not lose sight. I mean, I don't want to so much be successful in the way that in the yeah. realm of some of the artists, because they're also artists are play a role that they don't know when they work for institutions and they come to a neighborhood like in Detroit or Cleveland to fix, to um, add their two cents. And they don't know where they've landed, but they've been selected by that machine and then yeah. brought here. And then they go around, do their little research, and then they present it in the exhibit and they get more crackers and cookies and they just want the cookie. But their work is about change. And, you know, a lot of times it, 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 it's about them. Yeah. You know, so. Well, I wanted to say um, about the letter writing that um, I am starting. My classmate today brought me um, Marvin Gaye stamps and Kwanzaa stamps. Oh, great. So <laughs> I, will, I will be starting my letter writing. But one of the things that um, I, I've been thinking a lot about in, in <laughs> upheaval, too, is, you know, how how change happens in terms of you know, the institution, which um, functions as um, a system of maintenance. It's, it's not meant to, to change, it's meant to maintain, you know. So, you right. know, you can get, very well get a person of color in there as executive director, but that does not mean that, that they can, you know, overturn it over, you know, and the, the whole point of its existence is, is to continue as it has been irrespective of who's in the, you know, who's in the corner office. Um, also, something else, things that I've been thinking about too, um, are, are essentially these, um, you know, sort of hardcore dualities, like the um, relationship between wisdom, wisdom traditions, and the, and the intellect, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. how we deal with, with struggle um, and change. And also, you know, the duality of um, power and authority. You know, you may have power, but what about, that doesn't mean that you have the capacity to change something, you know? So I've been looking at how those things work um, in relationship to each other and also in relationship to, um, you know, feeling a sense of progress or a sense of change or revolution even. You know, it makes no sense to me that in this day and age that people are still asking Angela Davis about her hair care regimen. Oh. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. So that's what, you know. Ty Tyrone, I'm waiting to hear from you. Yep. Uh, okay. <laughs> and now I feel like the student who's at the back of the class who's, what? <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn off my phone here. Oh. Pay attention. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, you mean the question of authority in, in this? I mean, I mean, I think the one thing that's one of the things that explains the difference between, the, the, you know, the moment we're in now and, um, say, the '60s, '70s, '70s, and so forth, is because is uh, obviously due to the internet and you know uh julie you were talking about everything becoming more homogenized well you know the great thing about um the the internet and um is that it led to something like the arab spring however short-lived it, it was uh mm -hmm. because people were people were able to text and you know about where to meet and how to you know they were able to get information very quickly to each other across great tracts of land and time. On the other hand, what that also means is that um, everybody understands, this, you know, we all get exposed to the same products, the same ads, and the same ways of thinking, even ways of radical thinking, we get exposed mm -hmm. to the same ways. And so what that means is, it means then is that the sort of things you were talking about earlier, about very local, pra pragmatic, you know, things that are going on, on the ground, you know, when I was growing up in Detroit, you know, the Panthers were giving out free breakfasts and lunches. And when I read mm -hmm. about things that were going in Oakland, I, it didn't even seem like the same organization because they had no real connection to what was going on in Oakland versus going on in Detroit and Chicago and Cleveland. Yeah, I but, remember that. It was, 
but today, of course, you can imagine that would be very difficult to do because now, again, even on the left, it's very important to have coordination so that to a certain extent, what's going on on the, left, on the one coast is you know, replicated on the other coast. Now, that did lead to things like Occupy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, but also in terms of you know, widespread dissatisfaction, this goes to Andrew's point about you know, people, can people see what's going on? Well, the people who can see, who see what's going on and reject, shall we say, the, the messages of the mass media, Fox as well as you know, CNN, are not just people on the left, but also people on the far right. Far right. Um, the, I can't think of the, the, the young man, the, so the army, former army guy who killed a, a police officer mm-hmm. recently, uh, was just arrested. But there, so there's, so, so there are people on the right, and don't forget, this goes all the way back to the Tea Party and even before that, that everyone is rejecting these mass, you know, mass media in that respect. And they're able to do so, and this is true for my students as well as yours, Andrews, is because no one really pays attention that much to mass media anyway. My students don't watch TV. You know, they're, they don't, so they don't, they don't read magazines, you know, general magazines or anything like that. So on the one hand, they're not exposed to that kind of mass, you know, um, coercion, if you will. On the other hand, they get it in micro levels because they're all watching the same Instagram uh, feeds. Ah. So um, what well that, but what it also means for my students is that, uh, and this goes to Giovanni's point about language, is that, you know, I still find it somewhat disconcerting, although I'm used to it by now, to see my white students in the hallway, you know, using the latest rap lyrics and songs and so forth, things that I don't even know, but they're very familiar with that lingo and that language and so forth because it's all part of the corporate miasma, if you will. Um, right, right. And so in some strange way, we have finally reached what <laughs> Ralph Ellison, you know, predicted and hoped would happen is that, and he predicted this, he said one day black culture will infiltrate America so much that people will forget that it's black culture. And yep. here we are. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was thinking of that recently. Yep, it's all... <laughs> hey, boy. Well... Sad thing is why. Well, that that it gets... Uh, that culture gets co-opted. Right. Like every other culture. Right. Um, so we've made it, well, it to the east side, up, upper east side, if you will. Except for who profits, you know? Well, the and, same. And that's another thing. When the system, they, they select, uh, I notice in this community coming back, and the reason why I feel that way is because I have something to compare to. I'm sitting where I grew up, and, right. um, and I'm in and out of the city in my secret lair uptown. But um, what I... I I feel is that they, they hold up these examples. This is what happened until now. Now that the, the truth is out and right. uh, as, as the last several years, but that, um, you know, gave this impression of this normal, normalcy in terms of success and, and, and uplift. And it was a lie. I mean, black folk are as bad off as they were in 1880 and, and, and um, economically and, um, but it's it's not uh, it's a different world, obviously, because of the reasons you just submitted technologically, et cetera. The comfort level. I I, heard, I saw someone on um, uh, had a sign that said, "We're not our ancestors. We will fuck you up." And and somebody I I didn't like that statement, and I, I was thinking, are they kidding? Do they realize that you couldn't even go past your uh, your the property line? The people, you know, their arms were tied. Um, you know, they didn't maybe mean it as an insult, but um, but the, what it it made me think of different notions of freedom, and you know, so we were sold this idea that oh, these kitchen gadgets will free the housewife, and and what was it? Uh, Betty Friedan said, "Hell no, I'm out here in suburbia, more in prison than ever," <laughs> and and so it's um, interesting, interesting. So I guess. This time of COVID and protests, I'm so happy to see people marching. I don't think they would be marching if if they if it wasn't for COVID 
and people had the time to get out in the street because it used to bother me that every six months or once a year you'd have these climate change marches and and I was like people don't I'm just saying it's the consistency it's it's treating the earth like a drum and beating that note into the until it vibrates and shakes the earth and so you know we're here I don't like as what Giovanni was calling um, um, earlier when she helped me out with making sure I would be connected by phone. Um, you would, she was talking about cancel culture. This, this, uh, it's a, this kind of mob thing of like, you know, uh, throwing, uh, what is it, bricks to glass houses and people thinking that their drawers are so clean and then wanting to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been to pull people down, down, down. And that, that you know, has bad consequences yeah. for the people who are doing that. <laughs> you know, you two, you two need your own talk show. Just radio Tyrone, because we don't want to see their faces. No. I, I, feel, I mean, I think, well, Tyrone, go on. I, I mean, I think, you know, for, for me, it's been so important, even more so, you know, since being in a PhD program, to stay connected to um, the larger community and to a wisdom tradition that everything does not have to come in the form of a quote or a connection to some dead white person. Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's I mean, do, do you know what I'm saying? Like how to think for one. I don't see why you're apologizing. These two white people are alive. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we were dead, you know, but, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, again, my concern is we, you know, having having the capacity and the, the ability to still connect to a wisdom tradition where you learn by experience that then does not get subsumed or left behind. You know, it's the same so thing. You won't... That, and, and so that's, oh. you know, that's what interests me about, about Julie because she's always pushing me to the limits, as you guys can imagine, about, you know, how to think for yourself, how to examine um things i mean it's just you know sort of like this ongoing horrible version of debating like you know the buddhist monks or what have you so she's very hard-headed but um I, you know also looking at you know another duality which is the the difference between you know when, when um freedom and liberation right julie's like talking about you know what's happened before but it happens on a continuum that one could be free and still not liberated right that you're not wholly in charge of your own, um, your own self, your own purpose, um, your own way in the world. Mm-hmm. Bump up against yes. sorts of things and say, "Well, you are free." But what is that? What does that truly, you know, truly mean? You know, this kind of quote unquote freedom. And do you stop? You know, is that is that really a make change? Well, maybe it's going to go from nation building and and stuff to uh, uh, more people building so that the people themselves become products and they can cash themselves in. And if you really, really need to help with those student loans, Giovanni, I suggest you right now um, um, begin marketing images of a black aunt, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a white aunt, <laughs> and put her on the pancake cake box. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, Tyrone, you did that project uh, with that. Um, uh, uh, what is the, the project with the the maps and uh, the uh, Oklahoma bomber? What was it, Timothy McVeigh? Right. Mm-hmm. What's the name? I, please yeah. refresh my old mind. What's the name of that project? How, that book. How. How. Yeah. H o w e l l. Yes, I have and, my. And then, <laughs> go T-shirts on. to follow. <laughs> I think that would be awesome, Tyrone. Well, I like Giovanni, your formulation of systems of maintenance. You know how you were kind of characterizing uh, those forces within the broader, you know, culture that would um, deny people the agency that that you and and Julie were just you know, talking about. Uh, I mean, I, I was reflecting this morning <laughs> as I was in the shower 
and I'm I'm trying to you know wash the shampoo out of my hair and also I became aware that I was completely unaware of washing the shampoo out of my hair in fact what I was actually doing was standing under water and not even noticing the nice warmth of the water as it ran over my head and my shoulders instead my mind was rifling through this endless list of tasks you know work related uh stuff uh the continuing protests having lived under several helicopters 24 7 for two weeks uh, mm. where i live and uh and it also you know as soon as i recognized that i was like it broke that spell and I was actually able to have a couple minutes of, of just pleasure, just feeling the water running over my body. And then I, I got out of the shower and I was thinking about that maybe in relationship to, you know, our, our conversation still several hours away at that time in, in poetry. And I, I felt like what I, what, I, what I fear losing is just having presence of mind you know, mm. uh, which I equate to the way, Giovanni, you were talking about the importance of, you know, it, individual agency, you know, and, and I feel that that is the thing that uh, poetry, when it sings to me, allows me that moment of presence of mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's like a few spaces that I feel is possible to have any clear thought within. And I, so, I get that from how having a cat. How to, how to maintain that, you know? Yeah, I think that that's amazing, Andrew. And I think that that's something that I'm finding about this time too, is, is being able to slow down. I've always, you know, valued revisiting the work, the material that I have in the way that people play a particular song more than once, you know? I mean, yeah. Tyrone CC is gonna be with me forever. I always return to that. I return to how, you know, it's, it's, it's right there and it's really important, I think, to have this sense of, of the contemplative, of revisiting, of going deeper. And I think that lost that is like, okay, when the Pulitzer, you know, do this, what, you know, get all of these things and then next book, you know, or next book, mm -hmm. And so just not having really the interest, time, um, or commitment, I guess, to sit with what is right there, you know, or, or have this like, oh, I don't want to read this poem again because I've read it before. You know, I mean, I don't understand yeah. at all. And yeah. I just think that, you know, that is really, really yeah. beautiful, this idea of being in the shower and, and losing all, all kinds of what you're actually doing in the moment you know, and, and feeling connected to that, that movement and, and that process of processing, of being present. Well, that's a kind of experience of poetry mm -hmm. you described, Andrew, and a, an understanding of it that it almost gets to the, the, the poetry that I like best, which is not about reading through, but almost like living in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had yeah. some... I had someone respond to me once after a reading. She said, well, I felt like I was inside your poem. And I, you know, it's like, oh, you know, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, I, I hope we can have that. You know, that those that's the possibility of transformation. Yes. Parallel, parallel reality. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the water, Charles. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> This book is amazing. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, you know, I'm I'm weird. I have one foot in the 16th century half the time, and I'm writing poems right now that are my responses to contemporary issues. But I'm bouncing them off of 16th century poems by dead white men. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but. Uh, but I also, I'm, one of the things I'm hearing from friends and hearing conversations is that more people th that I w had been used to hearing 
are connecting these contemporary moments to you know the the uh, uh, oppression and lack of freedoms in this country that go back 500 years and i'm wondering if that is a wisdom uh, experience that will last in this nation or at least for a part of the population that didn't get that before you mean as a model uh, I, 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 well, it's Im impacting some people strongly that they are connecting to the history through slavery, through the beginning of this nation, through the, you know, thievery of lands and, and all sorts of things, and understanding that, you know, America has never lived up to its promises of liberty, equality, and justice, and all that. And do you think many people are feeling that, and will that be a feeling that lasts and that matters? Or is it just me? I don't know. Yeah. The people stay in the street, it might. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing that they actually, um, I mean, I'm sorry for all the arrests. I think 10,000 people were arrested. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's heartbreaking. And I'm, I'm not sure sometimes that, um, I mean, the, the, the right to march and to vote under the kind of surveillance that we had. We just had the, we had the FBI running raggedy and Interpol and whatever, trying to suss out details and nab people. But this is a very, they can tell from, our, from the moon practically who, what, when, where. And um, I just noticed that one kid was arrested for setting a precinct on fire mm -hmm. in Colorado. He looks very young and I worry about youthful idealism and 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 government uh, force, and um, but I'm I'm heartened to see people just uh, in the street voicing their concerns and you know rethinking what looting is. You know, like the mm -hmm. people I saw something said the museums are full of loot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> with, so then I imagine what are they going to do like. Uh, Next, loot the museum, and then all the artists that you who have work in it, million dollar artists, they're going to come to the yeah. defense of the museum. Will Kara, will Kara Walker come and defend a museum if it's tearing down um, the walls? And people are like, yeah, that's all loot, you know. Um, and if it keeps going, you know, how it will be defined um, and, and redistribute resources that uh, have all been going into the one percent pot. But Andrew, I was thinking, you know, do you have to take your cat into the bathroom the next time you shower? <laughs> I was thinking about Derrida. I, I, I listened to Derrida. I, I can't remember if I was at NYU or Cooper. And he ended up doing this whole philosophical um, a, a, a book. I didn't find, I read the book because he was in the shower and he noticed that the cat noticed that he was naked. So that takes us all back to the Garden of Eden. But um, <laughs> how did his cat happen to notice that Derrida was naked? Uh, you know, just is beyond me. But but talking about cats and cats, <laughs> my my kitty did this last week at one moment. I guess looking to where I had gone, I was again in the shower. Actually, stuck her head <laughs> in the curtains and and looked inside to make sure I was in there, and it wasn't just I guess running water. She was very concerned, you know. And I turned around and I looked at her and said, "Do you want to come in?" And she just kind of looked at me and then she withdrew, you know. But, uh, but Julie, to your comment about uh, people, you know, in the, in, in the streets and everything, have you, I mean, I've been incredibly moved and, and, and impressed at the uh, eloquence and uh, intelligence of just, you know, random individuals that the reporter walks up to. Why are you out here marching? And it's just like, talk about presence of mind. I mean, I would be like stumbling over my teeth, you know, to try to mm -hmm. hear a thought in that moment. And these people are like, they're on it, right? And, and they've said some really insightful things. Not everybody, but a lot of people have said some incredibly, critically insightful things, you know? And, and yeah, all this corruption has put a lot of people on... on, on um... I'm sorry, go on, Tyrone. <laughs> Tyrone? I didn't say anything. 
I and you don't have a musical interlude. Oh, like I see. Am I supposed to start it's a singing? Commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Sing for your supper. So, Sing so, for my supper, exactly. I, that's I, hey, I, that's I what it's like in the classroom. Oh, that's yeah. That's what it's like in the classroom. <laughs> singing for your I supper. I worry about so, not being, um, not seeing certain people ever again and not being able to hug and uh, be close. I mean, that's that's really i mean maybe people there would be a new hugging the tree and pet rock uh um um movement and then people will contemplate interspecies um dialogue and less hum <laughs> less human centrism and it'll go back to derrida and the cat but i did see orange cat notice i was naked so i understand uh, last week i told <laughs> i do realize what he was talking about that cat seen me my whole life and then all of a sudden, he had these different eyes on, like, what is that? So Tyrone and Andrew and Charles, I mean, so how has teaching been for, for you all, and how has it changed and in terms of how you relate to students um, and a life mediated by the screen? <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm going to give that up to them. <laughs> Go ahead, Charles. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I have taught, I taught two classes this spring, which were online, but they were going to be online anyway for the University of Houston, Victoria. And it, I mean, the, I, it wasn't much different than when I taught that before, except I found it, the student's attention was very distracted, of course, because they were having, you know, issues with their families, issues, uh, you know, with their everything about their lives. And uh, I just made it much more, I, I probably made the courses much more easy for them, but, but also uh, tried to keep things open. I pretty much dispensed with deadlines and things like that. And just tried to be as supportive as I could and just still getting material across. I don't know what else to say. I, I'm, I wasn't involved so much as Andrew and Tyrone are with employment issues at the university and how that relates to teaching. Well, when, I, when we switched, um, so I had three classes, but two of the classes, my honors classes, I actually um, had already planned to do a lot more, or I guess you could say stuff that would be more palatable online, like uh, some visual videos and, and music. Mm -hmm. So from, that, from, from a pedagogical point of view, the shift was not that difficult from my point of view. But like you, my, uh, or like your students, my students had a lot of psychological and um, mental issues. Uh, about returning home or wherever they were staying. Um, and so I had to take, so we, in fact, we were encouraged by our, the administration to be, to not use deadlines, to be very, you know, supportive of the students. If they had work issues, I had one student who actually gave birth during the semester. So there were a lot of um, um, issues that 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 arose, um, and I don't. Th I think that's one reason why, according to the administration, but also I talked to a few students. The students actually are very excited about returning to campus in person, because of the experience they had online, that which most of them did not like. They did not. They missed their friends. They missed the connections, and, and so forth. So, you know. Um, I don't think they've yet thought about the realities of what being in person re really means. They haven't thought yeah, through yeah. that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that because of those who had that experience in the spring, for them, it was so bad for the most part that all they can think about is being excited about coming back in person. Is your campus going to reopen? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, it's, uh, we're going a week early. Like a lot of places were ending by Thanksgiving. Um, but as I think Alden Nielsen pointed out, because the whole point, and we're just teaching on Labor Day, so the whole point of this is mm -hmm. to, to prevent them from you know, going back home and you know, to hot spots, as it were. 
But of course, as someone, you know, Alden said, well, what about where they're coming from at the beginning of the semester? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that's, we, no one knows about that, you know, um, and they aren't going to have any testing. Our health um, client or um, health provider has said that testing is impractical. And so, <laughs> i.e., they don't want to pay for it. You know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, we're just they're just going to do the contact tracing thing, um, which means that people who are asymptomatic will fly right through, you know, um, with no problems whatsoever. They're going to try to contact trace on all of the students. That's what they said when they arrived at the beginning, only at the beginning of the semester. Wow. Administrator's dream. It is a dream because, you know, you've, I mean, you've seen this stuff on Facebook and you, you guys, you know college students, right? I know college students. There's no way in the world they're going to stay six feet apart from their friends they haven't seen right. for, for years, I mean, for months. You know, at night they're going to go out and do what, they, what college students do, you know, so. Yeah, that's more complicated than, than testing. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. 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 I want to say here that I, I'm going to have to end this in about 10 minutes. And okay. so, uh, I mean, Andrew, certainly you say something about teaching, but then if anybody else wants to say anything that they haven't been able to say yet, please try to do so quickly. Well, I love I mean, you all. Uh, love you too. Love really? you too. Um, I mean, just really briefly, my experience is pretty much similar to, you know, Tyrone and Charles, what you've said. Uh, most of my students really missed meeting in person. They did not like the online platforms such as Blackboard, which is like, yes, oh, you know, oh, it's so, it's so horrible. And, uh, and so, it, so there's that. Also the fact that, you know, at CUNY, uh, you know, I had like 75 students you know, in three completely different Whoa. So translating what I do in a classroom with actual breathing bodies online. And also, by the way, we were told on a Wednesday during a departmental meeting that all courses across CUNY were being suspended the very next day. The, the day, the Thursday, that I had like two of my main classes meet. So I never saw my students again. After March, no. I never saw them again, right, in person, you know. Right. And then, to the points already made, there are so many complications because, again, I'm at CUNY. Well, the majority of students are from families who are, you know, working class and poor. Uh, I had so many stories from my students. Their parents had lost their jobs. They had lost their jobs. Uh, I had a young woman who was a brilliant student in a freshman class. She was stuck in a home with an abusive husband. They'd been trying to get, you know, she, the divorce was already in the works. He wasn't working. She worked. She's got a young daughter. She lost her job and had to move. It, it was just like story. I, I was being traumatized just feeling the, the know, grief, the impossible situation created for majority of these young people that are like 20, you know, 19 or 20 years old, you know, undergraduates. Mm. Um, yeah. So there's that, but as Tyrone and I have been, you know, sending each other emails and updates, you know, for the last month or so about what's happening structurally. Sorry, let me turn that off. Um, what, what's going on at CUNY and I think in many other colleges is the entire neoliberal uh, regime is <laughs> trying to basically dismantle uh, you know, faculty governance and uh, they're using the pandemic as a front yes. to basically really do serious damage, not just to, to faculty, but of course, who do the faculty serve? Students, right? Um, 
So, I mean, I have spent, I can't even count how many hours just in the last week writing long letters of analysis and explanation and sending them to my chair and sending them to other union officials, you know, in my union, all, you know, all good people and everything, but to try to figure out a strategy to protect our students, let alone the staff, adjunct faculty, and then full-time faculty, because everybody is being coerced to do things that in a, in a quote, rational, logical world, we would never even countenance, right? We wouldn't even think about it. Anyway, I'm ranting, but. Okay. Now Paul said, where is the rational world at? He wants to go. It's in his guitar. Plug your fucking guitar. guitar. And it, and was, it was in that can of beer, but. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Tell yeah. Paul I love him too. <laughs> Also, you, too. you know what? I, I have um, this project. It feeds into uh, different um, schools that are high schools from a prestigious kind of a private school to um, um, the local school down the street. Um, that was a school for the arts. But I got this call saying that children who had signed up for employment for the summer, it, they have it across the country it's called YOU, Youth unlimited that they had all most of them had lost their job because because of covid um employers didn't want to risk taking them on and so i had like a few minutes to decide if i would host them um you know op open up the building i primarily will work with them outdoors but you know with masks and social distance so here i am like Okay, I'm in a high risk group and I'm 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 but it's it's so heartbreaking to listen to all these stories. That's why people are so uh eloquent and forceful at the mics, because they're living these issues. They have been so sabotaged. The the, the average person throughout this nation, um and you know, just overkill. You know, from food deserts to just just pulling the carpet out from under everyone. So I think that that's that's why I was so intrigued and had this thing about give, passing the mic because coming back to Cleveland, I realized that everyone who presumed to have a certain quality of education, they I saw that they deemed themselves spokespeople for some of the people in the community who were quite capable of not only holding their own, but use language in such a poetic, captivating, mesmerizing yeah. um, way that you know, there's no lack of creativity when it comes to um, putting these is issues to words. And even the more, I mean, you could even see the way um, you know um, writing is taken apart and by you know um, some hip hop folks. I mean, so there's no end to people um, being creative um, with words and how to say something and make their point. So we can be heartened by that and just see ourselves in solidarity with them, no matter where we are, Absolutely. whether we're stuck dealing with these institutions and schools or, or in, a, in the Bronx Zoo, <laughs> dealing with polar bears. Yeah. Roaring with the lions. Roaring with the lions. Oh, I like that. Thank you.